Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today I wanted to do a review and walkthrough of a demo of this game right here. Uh, this is Vampire the Masquerade uh, Rivals by Renegade Game Studios. I was invited as part of their Gen Con media presentation sort of demo situation uh, to demo the game, or at least the game as it was at its current state. I do want to mention that this that I, what I got to play was not the final rendition of the game. I believe the game is actually going on Kickstarter Live this week. Um, so what I played was probably 95% of the final version of the game, but it was strictly a demo. Uh, it was online. It was a digital build of the game that they put together for this. Um, it was hosted by one of the um, one of the developers or, or one of the team over at Renegade Game Studios, and it was myself and three other members of the various media content creator group that were invited. And we didn't get copies of the rulebook, or at least I didn't get a copy of the rulebook. I didn't get an overall look at the game components of what they're going to be like in the actual physical box. I just got tossed into the demo and got a, a chance to play the game. Uh, and we almost completed a good chunk of the game, I would say. We played for about two hours, and it was, it was a lot of fun. So the game itself is pretty straightforward. It's basically each of you is going to play a faction of rival vampires who are living in, I think, San Francisco, from what I got from the game setting and the, the images on the various cards. Um, and you are basically attempting to overthrow the others so that you can sort of reign over the city. That's your goal. Um, each faction is unique in the way that it plays, not so much so that the game is asymmetrical or anything like that, but like other card games, they have their own flavor and their own style, their own agendas that they're trying to achieve, and that's how they're going to win the game most efficiently. But all of them follow the same rules for the most part. So uh, looking at the overall you know, setup of the game, uh, what you're going to have in front of you is you're going to have your faction deck. That's where all of your faction-specific vampires are going to be. You're going to have your starting vampire, your leader, that's going to be on the table with their leader uh, token on them. That's going to remind you that they get plus one influence. That has to do with voting and some special actions later on in the game. But mainly you just need to know that they're your leader. And they're going to have some blood tokens on them. That's equal to their starting HP, which is noted in the upper corner of their card. I'll get into what's on the actual vampire cards in a minute. Then you're going to have, other than your faction deck, your main deck. Your main deck also is tailored for your faction, but it's going to have non-vampire cards in it. So it's going to have action cards, special attack cards, um, special event abilities or, or action abilities like conspiracies and schemes that you can utilize, um, ongoing abilities, things like that. Non-vampires. Um, you're also going to have your Haven card. That's basically your safe place, your safe house for your faction. That's going to give you um, a special benefit listed on the bottom of it that sort of triggers based off certain things that might happen throughout the, uh, the rounds of the game. And it also lets you know that while you're in there, you get plus one secrecy. And I think that's standard across the board for all Havens. Secrecy is how your vampires remain safe when they're in the Haven versus out in the streets doing what they do out there, either fighting other factions or going after humans or things like that. So while you're in your Haven, you get plus one secrecy and also one special benefit, which I believe is unique to your faction's Haven. And then you're going to have your agenda card. Your agenda card, I believe, again, is specific to your faction, and that's going to let you know two things. It's going to let you know how many agenda points you need to win the game. I think that's 13 for everybody, at least with these starting factions. I believe the uh, the guy that was the gentleman that was running the game let us know that it was 13. Um, and it also lets you know one additional way in which you specifically can gain um, agenda points those to get to that 13 to win the game and that's one way that you can win the game there are multiple ways multiple ways to win and multiple ways to lose so other than that for some tokens like I said you have the blood tokens and the uh, leadership token or the leader token on your starting vampire you're also going to have some prestige tokens over here on the side I don't recall what the starting number of prestige tokens was I want to say it was 15 and those are there to basically represent your faction or your clan's power in the city as a whole one way that you can lose the game is if your prestige tokens go to zero, you're out. You basically, you're, you as a group, as a faction, have become so weak you don't matter anymore. You've been run out of the city. You've been, you know, beaten out. You're gone. Um, the important thing about that is that when you want to pull a new fam vampire out of your vampire deck, your faction deck, and obviously you'll pull them to your hand first, but then when you want to put them into play, those prestige tokens are actually flipped over, and on the other side they are blood tokens. So prestige tokens directly convert into blood tokens. And when a new vampire comes out, again, you're going to see how much starting blood they have in the upper corner, and you're going to have to put that many blood tokens on them to mark their life, their sort of starting HP when they come out. And so because of that, the faster you ramp out vampires, the quicker you run your prestige lower and lower until it either 
you can actually kind of deck yourself and hit zero and knock yourself out, or you lower yourself to a point where another player will figure out a way to very easily do that and just take you out of the game. So you don't just want to flood your area with vampires, you want to use as few as possible and use them as efficiently as possible. Um, and I believe that's what we have for starting setup as well as sort of what comes with the, uh, the starting sort of components of the game. So once you get going, uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. Other than each player's individual starting setup there, you're going to have one row of cards in the middle of the table. That's going to be the city area and the city deck, and those are sort of the same for everybody. Everybody's working out of that same group. Those represent things like ongoing events in the cities and humans or mortals that you can go after, as well as some special police that might pop out from time to time and actually come after you as a vampire, or, or everybody actually simultaneously because you're vampires, they're kind of the vampire police. I can't remember their exact name, but I remember the acronym is SAD, S-A-D, which I thought was funny. Um, I got it like mid-game and actually yelled out in the stream, oh, it means, it stands for SAD, I get it. Um, but anyways, so on your turn, you're going to do uh, one of a handful of things. You start with the beginning sort of phase of your turn. First thing you're going to do is you're going to flip out a new city card. I believe you start the game with a number of city cards face up next to the city deck equal to the number of players in the game. Um, it, this can be played as a two-player game, I'm guessing as a three-player game, maybe your, your, or your rival is the person to your left or something like that, but I feel like we played it as a four-player game and I honestly think that's how it's going to work the best. Because one of the primary mechanics of the game, being that it's called Rivals, is that each player is going to have a rival. And they can only take certain actions or gain certain benefits while going against their rival specifically. And so if you have a four player game, you have two sets of rivals. Say it's the person on my left, the person on my right, and then me and you. And they're rivals, and we're rivals. And that's a great setup. If you have two players, it's kind of just like, okay, well, we're each other's rivals because we're playing each other. So it almost feels like the rival mechanic goes away because I only have you. So everything I do is going to be at you versus I could also hit them and also hit them or I could hit you and get some special benefit, but maybe you're really tough right now, so I don't wanna hit you, so I can't take advantage of my rival benefit, I'm just gonna go after them. So it's better when you have more than two. I'm assuming they have a mechanic put in there for three, like I said, maybe it's just the person to your left is your rival as opposed to the person across from you, but I think four makes for a really good setup after having played through the demo. So, anywho, um, you've got the city cards in the middle. You're going to flip out a number of cards equal to the number of players to start, I believe. At the beginning of each player's turn, you're first going to flip out an additional city card. City cards are things like ongoing events and humans and things like that. Um, then you're going to ready any of your vampires that are in the streets, meaning they went out last turn and did some stuff, by untapping them, because when vampires do stuff they tap, it's called exhausting, and then to flip them back you ready them. Um, and then you're going to return, which is any vampires that are in the streets come back to your haven and sort of go back into their safe place, unless of course there's some effect on the board that prevents them from doing that. At one point we had a streetcar crash, again I'm pretty sure this takes place in San Francisco, and that prevented all vampires in the streets for one round from returning to their haven. So they could ready, and they could you know, continue to do things like attack and use actions, but they couldn't return to the haven. So they were kind of out there in the open a little bit um, you know, a little bit at risk for one round. And that was everybody, that was just neutral across the board. Um, so you've got the city cards out in the middle beginning of your turn, new city card, untap your vampire or ready your vampires, any that are in the streets, and then return them home. And then you're going to go into your play phase. Your play phase, you're going to take one, uh, or sorry, two of several actions. And I believe, yeah, you can take the same action more than once. So the first action is you can draw an additional card. You won't use this a lot of times because it's not like you're ever running low on cards. I think you start the game with four cards from your main deck, and two, which is your non-vampire deck, and two cards from your vampire deck. So you're starting with a hand of six. There is no max hand size. And at the end of every turn, regardless of what you do, you're going to draw two more cards as you choose. So you can draw two more vampires, two more main cards, one of each, doesn't matter. So the fact that you can use one of your two play actions, or both of your two play actions, to draw an extra card seems unnecessary. There might be a time during your turn where there's nothing better you can do, in which case, sure, pull an extra card, why not? Load your hand up, get as many options as possible, there's no max hand size, so go for it. Um, but, uh, it, or I should say at least in this demo, there was no max hand size. But usually you wanna go with one of the other action options. So another option is that you can make, or actually I'm gonna, hang on here, I'm gonna toggle over to one of my little cheat shots that I took of the game, which I'll be showing you guys while we play through, or while I talk through this. The other action that you can take is that's um, 
unhosted, and to quickly note on what unhosted means, some actions are unhosted, which means you can just do them. Some actions are not unhosted, which means a vampire has to exhaust in order for you to do that action. It's like the vampire is doing the action that you're playing, and so it uses their, sort of their turn. Um, so, two um, unhosted actions are play a card, or sorry, draw a card, uh, because obviously a vampire is not doing that. And then recruit a vampire. So if you have a vampire in your hand and you want to put them into play, in which case you'll take prestige tokens and flip them over into blood tokens equal to their starting blood, uh, that is also unhosted because a vampire isn't going and getting another vampire, it's just one more showing up. There's nothing like summoning sickness or anything like that. Uh, the turn that you play a card, you can use that card. So if the turn a vampire comes out, they can go to the streets and do some stuff. The turn you play like an ongoing action ability that you can exhaust to utilize, you can start using that right away, it's fine. There's no delay on any of this. It's a very fluid moving game. It's one of the things I want to talk about after I get through my little spiel here. So, two unhosted actions, draw a card, recruit a vampire. Then you move into the slightly more uh, complex actions. And again, you get to pick two of these, any two of these, any combination, including the same one to, uh, twice every turn. You can make an attack. Choose one of your vampires that isn't already exhausted and send them out to the street. And they're, once they're out there, they're going to decide who they want to attack. They can attack something in the city, which is the, you know, the humans out there on the streets, or they can go after another faction's vampires directly. You generally don't want to do that until you're a little more powerful by building up some special abilities or collecting some humans as retainers. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but you could go right after other factions' vampires if you choose. Going after them in their haven is difficult because when they're in their haven, they get plus one secrecy. I believe that's a constant around the board. And you can't go against a vampire unless you have more uh, intel than they have secrecy. And you have a base intel of zero. So they're already up one secrecy over you. You'd have to get two intel to be able to go after them in their haven. Um, so it makes it more difficult. When you're out in the street, you lose that secrecy. So you're more vulnerable when you're out in the street because you're not in your haven. You're not hiding, basically. So if you want to attack, you take one of your vampires that's not exhausted, that's ready. You move them out to the street. You choose what you're going to attack. Say, for example, there was a human, a mortal, in the city cards. And you wanted to go after them because, one, they're easy to fight, they're easy to defeat. And two, whenever you defeat a mortal that is a retainer or has the retainer keyword on them, it means you can do one of two things afterwards. You can either burn them, in which case you're going to discard them to the city discard pile for a special ability, or what I usually consider more effective, or at least what I thought was more effective in my playthrough, you can attach them to one of your vampires. I don't believe it has to be the vampire that defeated them. You're basically just going out and body snatching them and bringing them back and forcing them to be part of your faction as a mortal. Um, or maybe you're turning them into some kind of a slave. Who knows? Um, but basically they get to attach to one of your vampires and it will list on them what their burn effect is and what their attach effect is. And their attach effect is usually like some kind of a constant combat buff or an additional ability or a heal effect that that vampire is going to gain from having that retainer attached to them. And a vampire can have up to three retainers, I believe, attached to them at any given time. So that's actually quite a powerful way to ramp your vampires up from kind of basic to pretty, you know, pretty damn sturdy. And that's when you can start going after other factions, vampires. So that's going out and attacking. Whenever you attack, you're going to exhaust because obviously your vampire is doing something. And once you've decided to attack, you can play additional attack cards from your hand. I believe you can play one per attack that you're making. So uh, you send your vampire out there, you exhaust them, you, de you determine what you're going to attack and you declare that to the rest of the table because they need to know. Um, you declare what type of attack you're taking. On your vampire card, you'll see that there are several different attack types listed. You've got physical, you've got social, you've got mind. You might wanna make one of those over another based off of special abilities that your faction or your vampire specifically has, possibly listed on their card as a special ability, or from re um, retainer cards that are attached to them, or from special attack cards that are in your hand that you want to add to this attack. So say, for example, you have an attack card that adds plus two damage as long as you're making a social attack. Well, obviously you're going to make a social attack. Well, what if your social is zero and you have a physical of two? Well, that's kind of the same one way or the other. So do you really want to burn the attack card to do the same amount of damage? That's really where you have to decide, you know, how you want to utilize your special attack cards on top of your standard vampire attack and then any retainers that they have and then any ongoing specials that you have. At one point in the game, I put out an ongoing action that I could basically exhaust every turn once per turn when I was making an, I believe, a social type attack to add one to that attack, regardless of which vampire was doing it. So that was kind of a free floating buff for social attacks. So I was making a lot of social attacks, even with vampires that weren't necessarily good at social attacks. 
Um, my faction specifically also liked taking retainers and attaching them to my vampires. That's the way that I could gain additional agenda points. Normally, most of the time when you defeat a, uh, a mortal out in the city, you're going to get an agenda point for doing that. Like I said, 13 agenda points wins you the game. Um, so you're going to get one from defeating them in most cases anyways, but for me, if I also then attached them, that was a second agenda point. So I was really going after, you know, all of the humans out in the streets trying to get as many as I could because that was escalating me towards my 13 agenda point victory condition pretty quickly. So, again, you make an attack, you go out there, you'll see the number of, or the amount of blood that that call them mortal, human, has. It's gonna be in the upper left corner of their card, just like your vampire. You need to do that many points of damage via your attack in order to actually defeat them. Once you've defeated them, you can burn them or you can uh, attach them to one of your vampires. I like the attach function because it was getting me additional agenda points. Plus it gives you an ongoing boost, which is nice. Um, in your vampire exhausts and stays out there in the streets until the beginning of your next turn where they will ready and return back to your haven unless something stops them. And then the last two actions are both the simplest and the most complex. So there's play an action, an action card from your hand that you've drawn from your main deck. That's probably going to be an unhosted action, which means one of your vampires that's not exhausted is going to have to exhaust in order for you to use it. It might be a one-time boost, it might be a heal, it might be some cool trick that you can do with your vampires, or it might be one of the two more complicated yet awesome mechanics of the game, which are conspiracies and schemes. Conspiracies and schemes are this interesting voting bidding mechanic where you're going to announce that you're doing it, but not tell anybody exactly what it is and put it face down on the table. And those players, as you go around for you know the remainder of the game, are going to basically have to decide whether or not they want to participate in that thing. So I might play a conspiracy and put it face down on the table and say, I'm doing this conspiracy. And anybody that doesn't contribute to that conspiracy is going to lose two prestige when it flips over. And it's going to flip over when it hits six prestige. So I put it down, and I can put a one of my prestige tokens onto it. And then the next player goes, and they have to determine whether, and I'm, I'm winging this here because I didn't play any conspiracies, but one other player sort of did, but then we decided not to, so I only got a, a gist of this, but it sounded great. Um, so I put a prestige on that. It goes to the next player's turn. They decide if they want to put a prestige onto it. And if they don't, they're basically trusting, or they're, they're hoping that what I said about them losing prestige for not helping me was a lie. And then we go to the next player and the next player. And as soon as that thing hits the number of prestige that it needs to trigger, I flip it over and show what it really does. Maybe I was lying, maybe I wasn't. And that's it, it happens. So if nobody's willing to trust me, I might just have to load that thing up with prestige on my own, which is really risky because I'm whittling down my prestige level and if hit, that hits zero, I'm out of the game. But if I get other players to trust me, because maybe this is the third time this game I've done a conspiracy and I've been honest about all of them, then I'm getting a bunch of people to put prestige onto it. And then if it flips over and it turns out I was lying and it just says, you just keep all the prestige that's sitting on this card when it flips over, I just stole a bunch of your stuff because you didn't know that I was really making it up. It's this really cool like fibbing mechanic like where you can mess with people's heads. Schemes are similar. Schemes you put face up and you announce what the scheme is. And so it might be something like choose up to two players uh, and it can include yourself. And those two players have to vote against the other two players whether or not the two players you chose steal prestige from the two players you didn't choose. And so this is where the voting mechanic comes in with your leader's influence as well as your own prestige. Your leader automatically gets plus one to their vote. So now every player is going to vote at the same time as to whether or not you should or should not let the two players you picked steal prestige from the two players you didn't pick, or you know the three players you picked steal prestige from the one player you didn't pick. And so it's going to be a us versus them vote. And whoever wins decides whether or not the thing happens. That's how schemes work. So it's interesting that you're in this game that feels very much like, all right, I'm building an army, I'm building a force, I'm strengthening my soldiers. We're gonna go out and we're gonna attack the other factions. And then all of a sudden somebody goes, whoa, 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 hold on, let's get political. I have an agenda here, we're gonna do some voting. Me and you, we're gonna go, and it's just like, all of a sudden it turns into this like, dirty political feeling like scheming system where you're trying to manipulate players around the table into doing what you want them to by calling for votes and you know putting these face down cards on the table and going oh tell, let me tell you what this is this and you just start you know making stuff up um i think that's how it works it sounded really cool the way that he explained it to us i really wish we had gotten to see it play out more in game but i really liked the way that it sounded and like the rest of the game it was fun and a little silly, but for the most part stayed in theme with the game, and it felt really fluid. Nothing felt clunky. Um, I should finish up with my description before I move into my overall feelings on the game. So, play an action card. Last action is the 
weirdest, hardest one that you can do. Somebody tried it once and it just seemed so difficult to pull off. So it's called claiming the Prince of the City title. So you can add titles to your vampires, like Sheriff, for example. Um, and that gives them some additional abilities. It's difficult to do because you have to pay a lot of prestige to add it to your vampire. So you're really lowering your prestige pool to ramp up one of your vampires. So you're kind of making a super soldier at the cost of your clan's overall um, well-being. Um, there is a title called Prince of the City that can come out of the city deck at random, and it's this sort of floating crown. And any player, as one of their two actions during their turn, can attempt to claim the Prince of the City title. But to do that, you basically have to first allow yourself to get jumped by every other player at the table, so you declare that you're going for it, then every player around the table, you know, starting with your left, gets a chance to attack the vampire that's trying to claim it. And only if they survive that barrage, and we can use attack cards and everything, all our special abilities, we can go haywire trying to kill you before you get a chance to claim it. And only if you survive do you then become Prince of the City, and you gain all sorts of benefits, uh, but some detriments as well. I think you get plus two influence on top of the plus one if you were already the leader. Um, however, your, secu your um, secrecy from being in your haven gets canceled out. Your secrecy is always considered to be zero, so you can pretty much get jumped at any time because you're such a high, you know, well-known figure once you're Prince of the City that anybody can find you and come after you. Um, and there were some other benefits as well, but basically it's, oh, I think it's um, every turn for the rest of the game as while you're Prince of the City, you gain one prestige and one agenda point. And so you're just naturally scaling towards winning the game plus becoming more powerful while you're Prince of the City. Once somebody has obtained Prince of the City, any other player can still take the action, claim Prince of the City. They're just stealing it from you. So it's just like it was on the city, uh, in the city um, cards, except it's on you now. But same thing, every player around the table gets a chance to jump them, and if that doesn't work, they just like steal it off your head and that, they just, they're the prince now. Um, I, again, I think that's how it works. I didn't get to see it happen in the demo, but that's another interesting mechanic where somebody can just become like a demigod, and it's up to the other pl three players to stop it before it happens, and if they don't, then it's this countdown clock to doom where that player is going to win, or else somebody has to go snatch the demigod ability from them. It's, it's cool, I like it. Um, those are the actions that you can take during your turn. Draw a card, um, recruit a vampire from your hand onto the board, claim the Prince of the City title, play an action card, or make an attack, which allows you to play additional attack cards. The end phase of your turn is Torpor and Mending, which I'll come back to, Sad, and Drawing Two Cards. So we'll start with Drawing Two Cards. Draw two cards, your choice. Two from one deck, two from the other deck, one from each, your choice. No max hand size. Then you've got the sad police. <laughs> Those are the special vampire police that can pop up in the city area, in the city cards. If they are on the board at the end of your turn, they will deal one point of damage to one of your vampires at your choice. That happens on every player's turn until they're gone. So somebody just go take them out. I think they have like four blood, you can just go nerf them. The only downside is you wanna go after, if you're gonna go after somebody and it's just not gonna be another player's vampires, you wanna go after humans, mortals, because they're often retainers and that gets you a benefit. Plus you're usually gonna get some, um, agenda points for taking them out. You don't get any agenda points for taking out SAD, and they're not retainers. So it's just a waste of one of your actions, but somebody has to do it eventually or else everybody keeps getting pegged with damage. Um, so they hit during the end phase. You draw two cards during the end phase. Last thing that happens during the end phase is Torpor and Mending. Torpor is this kind of eternal slumber that your vampires go into when they run out of blood. They basically come back to your safe haven, and I believe they get exhausted or turned upside down to notify, and their blood gets removed. On the first turn that they're back there, they're automatically going to recoup one, and they can recoup additional points if you discard cards from your hand, or from your deck, possibly from your deck, I think it's from your hand, for each additional point of mending that you want them to do. Once their blood reaches their actual blood level, so if they were a five blood and they now have five blood tokens back on them, they return back to their normal state and continue to play. So that's Torpor and Mending. And there are additional abilities and specials that you can use during your turn to try to speed that up. Some factions are better at it than others, stuff like that. So that's the, the game overall. You go around the table, you you know start your turn by flipping a card off from the city deck, seeing if that does anything right away, uh, readying your vampires that are out in the streets by sort of untapping them, bringing them back to your haven if they can, which is the return. Then you go into your action phase, you choose two actions from the actions available, which is draw, add a vampire, go for Prince of the City, play an action card, or make an attack. 
You can do two of those. You can do two of the same one at the same time if you want. Uh, and then the end phase, which is Torpor and Mending. The sad police come after you and do a point of damage if they're still sitting out there. Draw two cards as you choose from your two decks. That's your turn. Move on to the next player. And honestly, if you're paying attention and if you get the flow of the game, your turn almost goes that fast. This was a very speedy, fluid game once everybody started to get a feel for it. I got a feel for it pretty quickly. Some other players did too. Some players were having some sticking points, but I think that's because it was digital and it's hard to learn things when you're not face to face. And you know, card games are tactile. To see people turning things and moving things around in real life is easier to take in than trying to move a camera around, right click, rotate, zoom out. Like some people just aren't that computer savvy to feel comfortable learning a game like that. But once everybody started to get a feel for it, it was very quick moving. It, you know, I, I would know what I was gonna do by the time it got to my turn because the, first, the person to my right would be going and I'd watch the first half of their turn and I'd go, okay, they're not doing anything that affects me. All right, time to focus on what I'm doing. Okay, what am I gonna do? I wanna go after that human because they give a bonus to social attacks. I'm already doing pretty good on social attacks so I wanna boost that even further. So who can go out and attack? They can go out and attack, all right. They can only do two points of damage. That human has three blood. Okay, what do I have that can do an extra point? This attack card, I need to do a physical type attack. Okay, they're pretty good at physical so I'm good there. All right, that's my first action. It's gonna be it. And like, you can have all that ready in your head. It's really not that hard. The only thing that can sort of throw that off track is when the city card flips out at the beginning of your turn if it's something that completely derails your plan. Usually it's not. So, your turn, city card flips out, cool, nothing I need to deal with. All right, what was my plan? This person's gonna attack, okay, they go out, I tap them, they're gonna go after this human, they're doing this type of attack, it does two points, they don't have any special abilities that can buff that, so I'm gonna play this action card, it deals an additional one damage of that act attack type. That's enough to take that human out. I'm going to attach that human to this vampire and they stay in the streets, they're done. Okay, second action, I'm going to play this action card from my hand. It requires, it's not unhosted, so it requires tapping a vampire. I'm going to tap my second vampire, which is my leader, let's say. Um, this is an action card that lets me um, exhaust it to do an additional point of mending anytime I want to once during my turn. Okay, that's my turn. I attacked, I played a card, I'm gonna draw one main card and one vampire faction card, and I'm done. On to you. That's it. That was me learning the game in like four turns I was able to play through my hand that fast. It's really not that complicated. It's very fluid. Um, it does get a little more technical once players start attacking each other because, you know, it's defending cards and attacking cards and there's a little bit more of a mechanic to that that I didn't get a chance to participate in that much. But essentially, they get to choose a card face down and they declare the attack type but they don't show you the card. Then you get to defend with a card of the same attack type face down. Um, some cards are better at defending than others. They're called guardians. Uh, they're vampires that are specifically good at blocking. And then you simultaneously reveal the cards that you were going to use. Uh, they might cancel each other out. And basically, if they do more attack than you do block, you take that much in blood loss. And you remove those tokens and you put them off to the side. Other than that, there's not a lot. There's going to get agenda points and there's, uh, you know, trying to not run out of prestige and there's building vampires up when you can, trying to help them heal when you can and not them go into torpor. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, another way that you can lose is if all of your vampires are simultaneously in torpor, you lose. You can't have nobody on the field. I think if they go into Torpor on your turn, you have a chance to play one from your hand and sort of like save yourself last minute. But for the most part, if you have no vampires, you lose. Other than that, if you run out of prestige, you lose. Um, you get additional agenda points for taking out your rival's vampires. I think you get regular agenda points for going after either other enemy if you're playing a four player game. But if you go after your rival specifically, you get bonus agenda points because they're your rival. There's also some actions I think that you can only take against your rival or that naturally get benefits against your rival. Um, so yeah, it's a very quick, fluid game. It feels really good with four players. I honestly think if we had started the game knowing how to play, we would have been done inside of two hours. I was actually about to take out the player to my left just as we decided to call it because he only had one prestige point left because he had played a sheriff, which took five prestige to put into play, and went after Prince of the City, which caused him to lose a vampire, so he was putting a bunch of extra effort into bringing them back. I forget exactly what else he did, but he knocked himself all the way down to one prestige, just kind of like playing wild, which was fun, because it got us to see a lot more stuff during the demo. But then I had a card that was a scheme that was one of those vote things, and basically three of us were going to vote against him to steal his last prestige, and as soon as we did, and we would have had the votes. So as soon as we did that, he would have been out of the game. So that would have been one player down, you know, after two hours of playing, and, you know, the, the other three of us weren't doing so hot either. Sorry about that, guys. My camera batteries died, unfortunately. 
And I was almost done too. I, I just wanted to say the game is really fluid. I really like the way it moved around the table considering it's a four player complex card game you know, complex as far as card games go. It really didn't feel sluggish once we got a feel for it. After three or four turns in, we were really moving along. And I'm comparing that not so much to games like Magic the Gathering because that's not really a, it's complex, but it's that's designed to be like zippy, streamlined, crazy fast. Um, at least until you get to like crazy pro, pro complexity. Um, but more so like games um, like, uh, Legend of the Five Rings, for example, the reboot that Fantasy Flight did a few years ago, or Arkham Horror card game, which I get as a cooperative card game, but those games, your turn, uh, and even going back and forth between a few rounds can feel very long and very drawn out and almost tedious because there's so much going on and you constantly have to okay, wait, I do this, and then, okay, we do that, all right, now it's this phase, all right, first this happens, okay. Um, how does that work again? Okay, you do this, these points move over here, okay, that lets me play one of those. Do you have a reaction? There's like so many little interrupts and pauses and breaks that it's like kuh, 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 kuh. like it's just mechanical, chunky machinery moving through your turn. Like I said, I mean, I, I talked my way through a turn in a demo that I took two days ago, just off the top of my head, and it went about as fast as it did in real life. It's a really simple game as far as taking your turn goes. Um, it's, it's not sluggish or clunky. It's smooth and flowing and moves around the table very nicely and I really enjoyed it. I can't think of another four-player card game where you're playing out of decks, like deck builder, cooperative, uh, not cooperative, but deck builder competitive um, card game, uh, where it's, you know, players against each other and against the center board that went as smooth. Um, it was really nice, I really liked it. So, <laughs> Vampire the Masquerade Rivals. I believe the Kickstarter is starting this week. Um, I wanna remind you that I did play a demo digital version of the game in its current state, which is not going to be its finalized state, but it's probably pretty close. And I really liked it. It was really cool. I'm definitely going to kickstart it. I told my friends about it as soon as I was done. Um, I definitely wanna get in some more games. I wanna try the different factions. I wanna see all the different conspiracies and schemes sort of come to life and see how those play out. Um, it seems like a lot of fun uh, to play through the full game, and I'm excited to. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. <coughs> this video just does not want me to finish it, now my throat's giving up. Uh, yeah. If you haven't yet, go down below, like, comment, and subscribe. If you leave a comment, I will try to get back to you. Hope you guys have enjoyed this. Uh, quick note, and I'm gonna put this in the beginning of my next video because I feel like putting it at the end of this video, nobody's gonna see it. But. Um, I crossed 400 subscribers, which is awesome. Thank you guys, you're amazing. I really love that. I can't wait to, uh, you know, continue to put more videos out and hopefully keep growing. And uh, it's very exciting stuff. So, <clears throat> really losing my voice somehow. Uh, I will see you guys in the next video. Have a good night.